for that introduction. It's really an honor to be here in beautiful Oman, and I can tell you how exciting it is to have TEDx here in Muscat. And before anyone says anything here on stage, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the organization of TEDx Muscat, because right now the speakers are on stage, and we might even get some applause. But the real hard work has already been done. The moment you entered, they already did hard work. So please, would you give a big hand to the organizers? Thank you. So, my talk is about an oasis, and it's not an oasis that you already know, like a fertile place in the desert, it's an oasis for the mind. And uh, let me explain. These are two of my two kids, two boys, Max and Felix. They're not often referred to as my sons, they're often called the micro gyms, because we look a lot the same, they have uh, my eye colors and they're pretty tall for their age, and we all like Star Wars and Lego and all thinkable combinations. When you think of, it's only a blessing that they have their mother's hearing and their, of her emotional intellect, but that's not really the point. What I'm saying is that because kids will ask anything. The other day, the oldest one, Max, asked me, Daddy, where do dreams go after you wake up? And that's an amazing question, don't you think? But these are not the questions that you should ask an adult on 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> I'm more like an evening person myself. So I did the best I could, and I, would, I said what every father would say. I said, well, you know, these are dreams. They tend to leave you in the shower. <laughs> it wasn't the best possible answer. It got him to say, well, I refuse to take a bath for two weeks. <laughs> but that gave me some time to think, really, to think this question through and read books about dreams, why we dream, articles about dreaming. Did you know that in an average lifespan, we spend six years dreaming? That's two hours each night, a dream lasting for six to ten minutes. It's amazing, don't you think? So I was thinking about this question, where do dreams go after you wake up? And after two weeks, in the middle of the night, Eureka. You know how it goes, you go to bed with a question and then you wake up with the answer. The answer was, dreams don't leave you. They stick with you. They find a place somewhere in your brain and they will wait until you see them for what they are. So how does TED fit in this? Well, TED is an extraordinary place. Why do people say that it's life-changing or such an amazing experience? It's because you're amongst people who dare to share their dreams while you are awake. And that's very powerful because the mind actually is working double time. The day job of the mind is to guide you through the day, but the night job of the mind is to guide you through life. And what I mean with that is that during the day your mind tells you, don't do this, don't do that, mind your step. And during the night your mind says, you can do anything. You can be a fireman. You will find the love of your life. There will be a TEDx in Muscat. <laughs> These are dreams, right? So, being at TED is a possibility to find people who share your dream. And this is the reason why some speakers move you, why they inspire you, while others can leave you cold. It has nothing to do with charisma or with being articulate. It's just they share a dream that you nearly forgot. They take you to your oasis of ideas. This is also when you have a click with a certain person. You share a common belief system, or as Simon Sinek says, people who believe what you believe. You share a dream. This is what happens. These are thousands and thousands of people who make the journey of their lives to come to Mecca, to be amongst people who believe what they believe, but also in football stadiums. These are football supporters, 80,000 people who know for sure, they believe that their, their, their team is going to win the finals. Thousands of people gathering at the Liberty Square, not for themselves, because they know that there are millions of people who believe that some things can be different. Or let me take you back into time. 250,000 people came to listen to Dr. Martin Luther King, and it wasn't because he had a Facebook page. <laughs> he didn't say, like me. No, he said, I have a dream. And as it turned out, many people had that same dream. They shared a dream. 
and the idea became a movement and had impact. So this is why I call TED an oasis for the mind, a place where you meet people who may share your dreams. Because TED is not only about spreading ideas, it's also a place to start a movement. In 2006, it was Al Gore who shared what seems like a nightmare, climate change. But he turned the nightmare into a dream. He turned an inconvenient truth into a global movement. Jimmy Oliver did something the same. He saw, he didn't see climate change, he saw a new epidemic, the epidemic of obesity. And he knew that there was only one way to stop it, and that was from the bottom up. He said schools should teach children how to cook. They should know what it is to eat healthy ingredients. That's the only way to show them there is an alternative to fast food, for example. And he's right. This year, in February, we had the artist JR, who won the TED Prize, and his dream was even bigger than all the other dreams. He said, if you believe in something, I think you should stand for it. I think you should join me in my new project, it's called Inside Out. Anyone with a dream and a bit of glue or paint or paper can join. He's turning whole cities inside out in Africa, in Brazil, even showing the faces of the Middle East. It's a beautiful project that anyone can contribute to. It's literally giving a face to common belief systems. Now, you may not be a former vice president, or you may not be an artist or a famous chef. And I know that sometimes you feel a bit lonely. You may be lost in the desert, looking for your dream, looking for your purpose, looking for your talent. But know that it is somewhere in your mind, waiting for you to see what it is. And coming to TEDx Moscow is a very good decision, because today you might discover it, or you meet people who share what you believe. So, before you all start movements, and I'll give you to the next speaker, I'd like to share a little thing about this book. It's written by Nicholas Carr. It's called The Shallows. And Nicholas Carr doesn't believe that the internet is a way to get your message across, to bring our culture further. He says in his book that the internet is changing the way our brains are wired, that we're going to have huge issues with problem solving in the future because we have forgotten the art of, quote, deep reading, because we're reading all this hypertext. The more links a text contains, the less you understand it, is his point. And he's saying that, we're, uh, that Google is making us stupid. Well, Mr. Carr takes 300 pages to bring his points across, but please allow me to take two minutes to say that's absolute nonsense and to prove the opposite. Why is that? Well, I don't know what Mr. Carr was... Well, he has some points, you know? I mean, attention is the most scarce resource we have, and it's coming more scarce than ever. And social media can be distracting. Sure, I gave you that. But what was he doing? Was he sleeping when TED Talks were downloaded 200 million times the last years? One talk, for example, by Sir Ken Robinson, 18 minutes about education. You can't call that shallow. That was viewed over 20 million times. What was Nicholas Carr reading? What was he reading when, when Mubarak saw that he couldn't stop the social media revolution? And I'm guessing yesterday, Nicholas Carr was reading a book about how to stop terrorism when his wife said, did you know that Osama bin Laden is trending topic on Twitter? He asked, why? <laughs> I mean, what was he doing? <coughs> Oh, but, but seriously, I don't think that the internet changes the way we think. I think because we think the internet is changing. It's becoming more and more what we want. And if you think of it, ever since we've been around, the way we communicate is a conversation. You talk, I listen, I react, I give you feedback. That's a conversation. And if you think about it, then the whole book era and the television era are the anomaly. I think locking yourself up in a room reading a book for five hours isn't very social, is it? So, reading a book is okay. And I'm not saying that, that, that reading a book makes you stupid. <laughs> of course not, but Google doesn't make you stupid. Websites like Tear.com don't make you stupid. I think Nicholas Carr is wrong. I think that Google and Tear.com are teaching us new ways to discover 
ways to learn in a social setting. So, I'm not saying that we should forget about books, no. Ted Sturz loved books, we all love books. We should keep on reading them. But we also should join this online conversation. And for Allah's sake, keep sharing your dreams. <laughs> keep sharing your dreams and exploring your talent. Because today, here at TEDx Muscat, you may find people who share your dream. Perhaps it's one of the speakers, because the moment we get off stage, we're just people with doubts and dreams as you are. And if you find somebody who shares your dream, step up to him or her and ask, how can I help? How can I bring your idea further? How can I bring your dream into reality? If you're a web designer, offer to design his or her website. If you're a copywriter, if you have a way with words, offer to write a brochure. If you have money, offer to pay some bills. If you're a consultant, offer your ears, offer your brains, offer your network. Do what you can do to help this idea to come further. Because I'm telling you, if we play our cards right, then you know we are not alone, we're in this together. And I'm saying you that TEDx Muscat isn't the goal, it's the beginning. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum.